And I think that was the thing that changed my outlook on human, just humans I was coming in contact with. If you think you're better than the person you're interviewing, yeah, then you've got a pride issue. That's right. Once you realize you're no different than the person you're interviewing, now you can start to at least approach humility. Everyone is, is fascinated with true crime. And, yeah. I, and I, I'm thinking of one of my daughters who loves to watch these crime yeah. shows. And, and these, these shows which would give me nightmares because they're about people who have psychological twistings yes. that make them the kind of people you're afraid to bump into yeah. in a back alley somewhere. Oh, my wife won't even watch them. And I've been on, I think, Dateline more than anybody else in the country working cold cases. But she won't watch them either because she doesn't want to go to bed with that idea in, their, in her head. Yeah, yeah. These pathological criminals. And, and you've made a career out of not only catching the bad guys through cold cases, but uh, with this new book, The Truth and True Crime, What Investigating Death Teaches Us About the Meaning of Life. Uh, I, I love this book and, and what you've discovered about human nature by studying why people commit crimes. Yeah, I think that's part of our fascination with true crime, too. I think we, we all see a little bit of ourselves in every case. So they kind of become like cautionary tales. Like, here's, I don't want to live that way, or I've got to be careful if I start to live that way. I think also yeah. at those key moments where you're about to do something you shouldn't do, like we have a glass of water here with the, the cup, you can actually see what's in there. But for most of us, you can't see what's in there until you nudge it. And then whatever spills out, you get to see the true condition of who we are. And most mm -hmm. of the time, these kinds of crimes occur when someone is, is hitting the glass, is hitting the, the cup, and you get to see what's going to spill out of our true nature. So you think that by, by, by watching these crimes take place, we see a little bit of ourselves in some of these I, people? I think is we that do. because by nature, we have the capacity to do some of these bad oh, yeah. things? Well, that's one of the chapters of this book. Is I, I used to work with defense attorneys who would say to me, well, I, I've worked with a lot of suspects, a lot of defendants, they would say, but this particular defendant, there's no way he could have done this. You know, cold cases are where you, someone did a murder 30 years ago, and for yeah. the next 30 years, they've been absolutely spectacular citizens. They are your deacon at your church. They're your dentist. Mm. They're, they're the fire captain. They're, they're people who are uh, performing quite well. Yeah. I think, there's no way that guy he can do this. That. Well, that's what, part of what we have to ask ourselves. Are we innately good and we are kind of corrupted by the systems in which we are placed? Right. Or are we innately fallen and broken such that we will corrupt almost anything we touch? It's one of those two realities or maybe a little bit of both. And we need to figure out which it is if we want to judge people properly. Also, I think it protects us, right? Because if I know that I'm capable of this, I can then begin to take safeguards to make sure I don't ever do such a thing. If I think, oh, there's no way mm. I could ever do this, I might fool myself and not be protecting myself from what and, tempts me. And so which is the case, do you think? Or at least which is predominantly the case? Okay, well, they've done tons of studies on this. I try to cite these. I look at each chapter is a crime story. Each chapter then looks at the studies that confirm whether this attribute of human flourishing has been well documented. And then finally, each chapter says, was that an ancient biblical principle? It yeah. turns out they all are. So here, I think we know just as parents, you and I are both parents and about to be grandparents, right? So we know that uh, you don't have to teach your kids to be selfish. You don't have to teach your kids to be impatient. It turns out we are natively selfish and impatient by our very nature. We have That's to right. be taught not to be those things. Why? Because we are deeply broken and fallen. And that really fits the Christian worldview. Now, is it are we, are we capable of great altruism? Of course. But we're also capable, the same person is capable of great evil. How could that thing we call the enigma of man be true under a, a kind of an evolutionary paradigm? It turns out that the biblical worldview explains this because we are created in the image mm. of God. We are capable of great goodness. Yeah. But we're also deeply rebellious. We've inherited the sin of Adam. So we're also deeply fallen. So through your studies of crime cases and the psyche of these criminals, you're actually um, uh, undergirding what the Bible has said all along. Well, so I have a lot of these cases in this book, I wasn't I yet a Christian when I was investigating some of those cases. I, I became a believer about, half, about eight years into my career, mm. uh, about 35. And so I would see things in human nature. I thought, that's kind of puzzling. And, but you can see they're, they're supported by the science, by the research of, of, of secular studies that, that look at these kinds of things. But, but it turns out if you've been holding your Bible, if you were familiar with the traditional 
Christian worldview as described on the pages of the New Testament, these 15 attributes of human flourishing mm -hmm. have always been there. They're ancient attributes. Why? Because they're not rooted in culture. They're not rooted in history. They're rooted in our biology, uh, created by a, a creator God who has created us a certain way. And that's the same, we're the same people we were thousands of years ago. Yeah. We just have new environments, but all those attributes of human flourishing, they haven't changed. Yeah. They are biblical. I, I would imagine that as a detective, as an investigator, coming to understand a biblical worldview and understanding that that really does reveal to you yeah. the secret code that drives <laughs> the human heart would help you to solve some of the cases because it's like you, you've got the inside track on the motive yes. and the, of the human heart. And, and, and let me just say this, Jay, I'm not a detective. Um, and, and there are memories that I have of reading the Bible as a young man thinking, man, that's a little bit harsh in terms of its description of the human heart. It was like, you know, I would hear things like, man, you know, the Bible says that if you really understood how bad the human heart is, and if God took his restraining hand of grace off of us, you and I would make Hitler look like a choir boy yeah. in comparison. Yeah. Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Desperate, and I thought, cannot be trusted. wow, even Mother Teresa, even Billy Graham, but you know that even the little grandma down the church yes. or the religious yes. person can be the very same person who snaps because yeah. at the very core is a deceitfulness and a wickedness that is in their nature. Well, and even, you know, this is secular studies demonstrate what Luther once proclaimed, that we are so inwardly focused that even the, the moral good things we do, we do for the wrong, immoral, selfish reasons. Ooh. So even when we think we're doing something that would please God, we're really doing it because we want the satisfaction of others seeing us do it. In other words, our motives are always self-serving. Now, this has been discovered by way of studies. So for example, we see that humans are very altruistic as long as it's, they can still benefit themselves. Mm. So they can, they can be quite charitable until there's a pandemic and there's a shortage of supplies and then suddenly we're all hoarding toilet paper. Why are we doing that? Yeah. Because it turns out that we're only altruistic until it stops serving us in some way. And then we stop being altruistic because we are our very nature, our core nature is selfish. And that selfishness is an important key to studying crimes because it turns out people only commit crimes for three reasons. Sexual greed, uh, sexual lust rather, financial greed, and the pursuit of power. Those are the only three reasons behind any murder. Mm. And what those are, are just, it's worship. It's, we don't worship the creator. We worship the good things the creator has given us that we're supposed to use for good, sex, money, power. We're supposed to actually use those to glorify God. And there's, there are good things intended for our good. But wow. because we stop short of the God who created them and we worship what he's created for us, we have a tendency to distort those. Every wow. crime you work, you'll be worked for one of those three uh, pursuits. Pursuits of what could be good things, but we've created idols out of them. Mm. And then we obsess over them. And whatever your idol is, that will be your master. And you discover this work in these cases. If you're somebody, for example, it's all about power, well, then you're going to be easily offended. And you might do something you shouldn't do because someone said something that really isn't that big of a deal. But because respect, authority, power is your idol, I'm going to be easily bruised if you say anything bad about me. Yeah, right. I might do something stupid. If, you're, if your idol is money, well, then suddenly the slightest uh, 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 thing stolen from you becomes overly exaggerated. I'll do a murder for the loss of $3. I got a case in this book where that's exactly what happened. Wow. Or if, you're, if it's sex, you'll never be satisfied. And most of these serial predators we see, we see are sex offenders. So you have to look at those three things and say, have you created an idol? where you've taken the thing that God has created and made that your God. Right. Because as soon as you do that, you will destroy game over. It. Yeah, it's game over. Game over. Jay, we're talking about the truth in, in true crime and how investigating death brings out the, the real meaning of life and of human nature. What have you learned about the importance of quality friendships by studying criminals? Well, okay, so sometimes we get cases where it's a spousal murder. Sometimes you're, I've got one case in here I talk about where this woman was killed by somebody she would have said was her very best friend. It turns out that the book of Proverbs and, and scripture is replete with, with descriptions of how you ought not hang out with fools, right? They'll say, it'll say that. Yeah. Like, pick your friends carefully, but how do we even do that? What does that even mean? Well, you just discover this working murders that people flourish, and studies will show this as well. They flourish when they have meaningful relationships, and we struggle when we don't. 
But the question is, what's a meaningful quality relationship? Well, mm. that's where the research is helpful, but also so is scripture. And it turns out what you want in order to have meaningful relationships, you can't have meaningful relationships with hundreds of people. Social media is not the place where you're mm. probably going to find your meaningful relationships because you don't know those people well. They don't have permission to actually talk about you, to tell you what's wrong with you. If you have a deep relationship with somebody, you've given that person permission to speak the truth to you. Mm. And you don't do that with people on social media. No. Even Jesus had the multitude, the masses, then he had the disciples, then he had the 12, then he had the three. This idea of meaningful relationship means you have to have a small group of people who you've given permission to know you deeply. So you need deep relationships with a small group of people. And the third thing is virtue. So this case I'm talking about in the book, yeah, she, she had deep relationships with a small number of people, but they didn't have virtue in mind. They were not objectively virtuous. They were actually objectively vile. And they drew her into bad things. And eventually she- So it was her, it was her friend, it but was she her was friend. just a friend who was yes, not deep, a virtuous person. Deep connected, but virtue right. was the missing element. Mm. Now here's the question. If virtue is important to deep, meaningful relationships, who gets to decide what is virtuous? Because, you know, if you work in gang cultures, there's an entirely different code of ethics. Yeah, that's right. And they would say, this is a virtuous behavior. We would say, no, not so much. Yeah. So it, it turns out that if you want virtuous friends, you'd have to adopt a view that there's a God that transcends all of us that establishes what is virtuous. Otherwise, virtue is just based on groups. Mm. And you can be in a bad group and they could think this is a good thing to do. Yeah. And then you're in trouble because you shouldn't have done it. So it, it does turn out that a lot of what we're looking at in this book really does make sense under a theistic worldview in which God is the grounding of objective virtue. You don't get to decide what that is because if you do, oh, trust me, there's lots of gang cultures, lots of crime cultures where their view of what's right and wrong is very different than what we would say is right and wrong. Jay, I've experienced exactly what you're talking about. As I've visited jails to share my testimony with people, I've asked them, who here would consider themselves to be a good person? And almost everybody's hand goes up in the air. Like, right. Wait a minute, we're in a jail. Some yeah. of you were here for a very long time. But like what you were saying earlier, we, we have these selfish motives that can yes. sometimes drive good behavior, but we can also have what we perceive to be our own virtuous standard that will justify evil behavior. Like, yes. hey, I'm doing this for the honor of my gang. Or I'm doing this yes. to provide for my family. And I had to take that guy out because, and all of a sudden, you, re you realize that virtue has been twisted, twisted. and turned on That's its right. head. And so you need God. Yeah. Let, let me ask you a, another category. What have you learned about, about family and, and the importance of family by studying crime? Well, okay. So it's, look, we've, we're living in a culture right now that says really almost any home structure, family structure, it will suffice. And the traditional views of the roles of men and women in terms of parenting, yeah. uh, they're antiquated. They're, they're culturally rooted. It doesn't need to be this way. But it turns out all of the secular studies, I mean, if you, certainly in the last, I would say, 20 years, you're starting to see studies where they're trying to say, no, 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 you don't need two biological parents to raise your kids. Well, look, to, to be honest, the data shows this repeatedly. Children raised in a home, a low-conflict home, by their two biological parents thrive at levels higher than any other group. Now, I was not raised that way. My parents divorced when I was three. And that's one of the reasons why I have a high value, high, high, I hold marriage as, as a high value mm. because my parents didn't. And so for me, a lot of it is that I recognize I was not raised this way. Is it possible to raise good kids? Of course, but your, your best opportunity to raise kids who are gonna thrive at the highest levels is when both biological parents are raising that child in a low uh, conflict household. Now, it turns out I'm not even raising my kids. I have two adopted children and two biological children. My two adopted kids are not being raised by, they were not raised by their biological parents. Did, did, I hope they did, we did okay, but it would have been far better if their two biological parents could have raised them in a low conflict setting. Why? Because we recognize in our kids some of the things that our biology had dictated in us. Mm. If you've ever watched your, I've watched my sons and said, oh, I know where he got that from. <laughs> that, that, that's me. I, I recognize that. I, I, I can resonate with him mm. because he's got some of my genetic material in him. Though, that's an advantage that we give our kids if we raise our bio. Now, look, that's not possible for everybody. Lots of blended families. I get it. But if we stop even chasing it as the ideal, 
we'll see even worse and worse outcomes in family units going forward. Mm. What is the ideal we ought to chase? Look, I always say it this way. If, if, if your idea was human flourishing and the 15 areas of human flourishing in this book, if you just simply wanted to throw the dart and hit the bullseye, in the bullseye of human flourishing, if you do that, you're gonna find yourself in the middle of the Christian worldview, whether you knew it or not. Because it turns out that those 15 attributes of human yeah. flourishing are 15 biblical principles for how we ought to live. If we simply were to embrace those unknowingly. Yeah. So when I became a Christian, I wasn't really interested in whether or not Christianity worked. I wanted to know, was it true? It turns out it's both true and it does work. Yeah. Now, isn't that interesting? I think we're in a generation right now that I, I'm a boomer. So, so yeah, I, I'm about the objective facts and I want to know if it's true. I don't think that my kids and grandkids are as concerned about that. I think they want to know, is it good? I think that when I say something is true, they hear it as, well, it's true for you because we've changed the definition of truth to be entirely subjective. So what they want to know is, is it good? Or is it the source of all evil in culture right now? Because it's being portrayed that way. Yeah. And if it's not good, why would I want to adopt it? Well, it turns out that Christianity is both true and good. Mm. And I just wanted to write a book that says, that, that does the second, is it good? Is yeah, it beautiful? Is it necessary? That's right. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm so excited to, 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 to read through this book again and, and to give a copy to, uh, some, to my kids. And um, uh, one of the other things that, that I love about your book is you talk about this, this um, concept of forgiveness and, and how your view of forgiveness has been shaped by studying criminals and, and yes. crime. Now, of course, forgiveness as Christians is huge to us. Yes. Um, uh, a, a real quick story. I remember being in Washington, D.C. at a Restore America rally, and uh, a, a, an older couple got up, and they talked about how they had lost their son to um, uh, a, a violent shooting mm -hmm. and how they weren't bitter, and they told this beautiful story of, of their faith and their belief in a God who redeems uh, uh, evil things and, and brings good out of them. Uh, is what kept them going. And then they introduced another young man who stood up after them, who said that he was in a gang when he was younger and he was put in prison for murdering another young man. And then he revealed that the young man he murdered was the son of the couple who had spoken before him. And he said that they showed up at his jail cell and told him that they loved him, that they had been praying for him, that they don't hate him, they forgive him, and they told him about a God of forgiveness. That's right. And when that young man got out of prison, they adopted him as their son and raised oh him in gosh. their home. That took forgiveness yeah, to a new level to me. Yes. How has studying crime shaped your view of forgiveness? Well, there's a chapter here called A Tale of Two Brothers. And really what I've looked at is what is the nature? How do we love like God loves? Like, what does that even mean? And it, it turns out that we know from studies, we have polar extremes. We are concerned about two things simultaneously. Justice, truth. We are justice warriors in our, our soul. Yeah. We recognize that some things are unjust. But we also respond beautifully to grace and love. So it's these two polar extremes. Truth and and justice, grace, and mercy. And it turns out only one being in the entire universe holds those two things in fullness. And scripture shows us this in both the Old Testament, where it says that, that God, that Yahweh is the place, is the being where justice and mercy kiss, that he is the fullness of truth and grace. Then John says that Jesus arrives. What does he say in John chapter one? A chapter which is really focused on the deity of Christ. He says that Jesus arrived in the fullness of truth and grace. Why is he saying that? Well, that's a claim to deity. Only one being holds mm. truth and grace that's right. in fullness. So th this is what, so when we wanted to love like God loves, we have to be able to do both of these in their fullness. Most of the time, we don't think of it that way. Yeah. Either we're focused on what's wrong with the world and we're really justice oriented. Ah, uh, this is not good. This is bad. I'm here to punish evil yes. and reward and, the And good. that's an important part of it. It's, it's half of it. It's justice. Or we're focused on just the mercy. I want to forgive everything and I don't, I won't even call anything out as, as heresy. I won't call anything out as even bad. I'm going to tolerate and accept everything. Well, that's all about grace. In order to do what God does, to love like God loves, we have to do these in equal balance. And what that means for us, for example, in our marriage, those are expressed in marriage under two concepts. The truth and, and justice side is really expressed through our desire and our ability to repent. Can we, as a spouse, repeatedly say, okay, that I was wrong, but I just, it was wrong. I need to change that. When we find ourselves saying, yeah, repentance is important, I need to change that, it's because we're focused on the truth of what God says, 
the justice, what's true in the world about our marriage, about our relationships, yeah. about God. When we say the other side of repentance is forgiveness. And am I willing to extend the grace? Here's what I know for sure. The people who are the least forgiving are the people who think they have the least to be forgiven for. And you see this in this episode with Simon, right? Where Jesus comes to yeah. Simon's house and the woman from the city comes in and lavishes Jesus. And Simon's like, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't let her even touch him. And he presents a parable. Jesus presents a parable of the two people who owe money. One owes a lot, one owes a little. If I forgive both debts, who's going to be most amazed at that forgiveness? The person who owes a lot. She understands, Simon, that she has been forgiven so much. That's why she's so gracious. You think, you didn't even wash my feet when I came in. You don't think you have anything to be forgiven for. Right. So you right. won't extend grace. So it does turn out that the more we sense that grace has been extended to us, the more we understand who we really are, yeah. the more gracious we become yes. with others. And the problem, Paul, is most of it, and this is another chapter in the book, is about this one virtue that leads to almost all human flourishing at the highest level. It's a virtue called humility. It's the opposite of celebrity. Yeah. It's the opposite of pride. Ah. And every it, it'll solve it, better marriages, deeper marriages, more longevity, better mental health, better physical health, better grades, better higher income. Everything you can think of that it, it is a marker of human flourishing is downstream from it humility. Is downstream from humility. Uh, wh where have you seen redemption come out of some of these dark, nasty stories? Oh, yeah, just, I've got a story in this book too about this because you see it often in in, in families where they've suffered a loss of a loved one. And now they're waiting for what they would call closure. And of course, there is no closure. I'm lucky if I can get justice, but I'm not going to close. At the end of it, if I convict this guy, guess what? Your sister's still dead. Right. I'm not going to be able to bring right. her back. So I'm not going to be able to bring that full circle for you. So then you got to figure out, like, what, how do I get past the trauma? And here's what I've learned about trauma that I think is helpful, and hopefully it'll help people who are listening is it turns out that, that you, you, you are going along in life, you've got a certain level of functioning, and you're heading along, and then suddenly something bad happens. Your sister is murdered, and it knocks you to your knees. And if you stay down there, you'll be what we suffer, we call PTSD. You'll be in post-traumatic stress disorder. You're post-trauma, you're not able to get back to where you were before. If you can get back to the level of functioning you were at prior to the trauma, we call that resiliency. But it turns out it's possible on the backside of a trauma to flourish, to, to actually function at a higher level than you were prior to the trauma. And we call that post-traumatic growth. Well, how do we get to post-traumatic growth? Well, all the secular studies call this meaning-making. Now, as Christians, you and I would say it's meaning-finding. In other words, we have to ask ourselves, Trauma is basically when you have an idea of the world and then something happens that shakes your view of the world. I didn't think life was going to turn out this way. Something happens that shakes my expectation and now I'm suffering trauma. You have to rethink your expectations. In other words, what is the true story of my life? Mm. And is this story of trauma the last chapter in my story? Or is it just the climactic chapter before the conclusion? Yeah. Before some beautiful, because every story has got that point of drama, right. the tension between the antagonist. Like the cross. Right, like it the cross. It seems like the end of the Can story you imagine for if you there, Yeah, if you stop the story at the cross, if you stop Job in chapter three, if you stop Mark's story in the book of Acts when he fails to go, John Mark, with, with, his, with Barnabas and Paul, he's a failure. Where is your story? How do you make sense of yeah. your, what's the larger narrative? It turns out Christianity offers a narrative because it offers, you know the whole story and you can find your chapter in that story and see how on the back side, many examples in scripture and Jesus is one of those. And it's not that he comes to us to provide an example of how to get past trauma. That's not why Jesus came, but his story is there. And guess what? He has the power to help you see your story. Mm. It, it turns out that most people I see who suffer trauma, they are simply sitting in that moment of trauma as if it's the last chapter. That's right. They haven't seen how God could redeem this for something spectacular. Look, I, we have a tendency to think that all suffering is evil. God would never allow you to suffer. He's not the author of evil. What if suffering is actually something powerful and good that could be leveraged so that you have an even an amazing life on the backside you never could have lived short of the trauma. Come on. If that's the case, then it's not necessarily evil that we suffer trauma. And you have to start looking and asking yourself the question, okay, so what is God doing with this? 
because he wants my good. He wants me to leverage mm. this experience so that the last chapters end a certain way. That's right. And when we find the meaning in that, we will thrive. That's why I could do a lot to kind of heal a pain. Actually, it's meaning finding. You have yeah. to figure out where this suffering exists in the overarching story of your that's life. Right. That's, that's and right. And if you can do that, by the way, you will, on the back side of that, you'll be like Johnny Erickson Tata, where suddenly you think, how could anyone have the impact that she has had? And you know her. So you, this is, how, how does anyone? It's that's because right. it's meaning finding. It's discovering how God will leverage that moment for something that you could not have done otherwise. And I love how in, in your book, that the studies, which you've got footnoted with about 200 pages yeah, of footnotes here, demonstrate that the Bible has been true all along and that God is the author of every single story and that those who find uh, post-traumatic growth uh, or redemption actually find themselves flourishing at a higher level that's than right. they were before the trauma. And, and that's why I think, whether it's a personal catastrophe or it's a national trauma, I think to myself, what if this is similar to what happened to Job? What if this is similar yes. to what happened at the cross? Uh, maybe not in, in magnitude, uh, but by the very nature of the thing, what if this setback is really a setup for a spiritual That's right. comeback? That's right. When I turn my heart to God and let him be the author of the narrative. Yes, and you can make up your own meaning of life. It will not do. If there is a mm. transcendent meaning of life that preexisted you, yeah. you want to find out what that one is. It, it, look, if Christianity is true, it ought to describe the world the way it really is. It ought right. to describe us the way we really are. It does. As, as a matter of fact, if you're interested in human flourishing and you don't even think that Christianity is true, you ought to behave as though it is. Because it turns out your f human flourishing is dependent upon you adopting the principles of Christianity, even if you didn't know those were the principles of Christianity. Because the Bible describes us the way we really are. Jay, if you were to sum up the most important thing you've learned about God by studying crime and murder cases, what do you think that would be? It's that the gospel is the cure for every kind of stupid. So you, everyone's seeing something right now in culture they think is stupid. If it's marriage, stupid. If it's political, stupid. If it's international war, stupid. Whatever the stupid thing you think, why are we behaving this way? Well, we're behaving that way because we have a sin problem. Mm. And the only cure for sin is the gospel. So, so because our problem is selfishness, um, and it's always pride, some aspect of pride, the prideful aspect we take as leaders in countries, leaders of families, leaders of businesses. These are the things that lead to sin. It's our pride. And the only solution for pride is a worldview that leverages humility. Think about it. The Christian worldview leverages humility like no other worldview. If, you, if you're in a worldview, even a spiritual worldview, where you're trying to earn your way into the favor of God by doing a certain number of things, or you're in any kind of merit, uh, meritocracy, like, like you're a secularist who thinks I should earn certain things and have certain outcomes. That is just going to lead to pride because every time you're earning something, you're looking across the room and thinking, I'm doing better than that guy is. Yeah. We're always comparing. How do you know you're doing well? By comparison. So uh, any worldview that leverages comparisons is just going to build pride. If there is a worldview, though, that says, you know what? It's not about what you can do. It's really about what I'm going to do for you. And I'm going to give you this thing that you've been chasing your whole life. I'm going to give it to you as a free gift. Why? So Paul says, so that no one can boast. Mm, I'm going to take the right. pride out of that's it. That's right. It's going to begin with you in humility, bending your knee. There is a God and you're not him. And it's going to extend with this yeah. free gift I give you so that it's, a, a, it's an equalizer. Nobody can say I'm doing better than you are because everyone's going to be given this thing if they'll simply trust Christ for their salvation, that everything you're trying to earn yeah. has, already been, has already been earned for you. Okay, that's a, that, isn't it interesting that the one aspect, the one behavior that leads most consistently to human flourishing is the one thing that's unique to the Christian worldview. It could be a coincidence, or it could be that the God of the universe who designed you in a certain way and knows that humility is the key to your flourishing has provided you with the one system the one theistic system that actually leverages humility. Mm. That is so interesting. And 
other thing that I've experienced when I am presented with the just condemnation of my heart and my sin, I know I'm guilty, is that it, when, then I, when then I receive the mercy and gratitude, which is the other side of, of the yes. nature of God, right? We, he's just, but he's also merciful. It fills me with way more gratitude than I ever would have had yeah. if I didn't clearly see how miserable I am, how empty and bankrupt I am. Yeah. So, so humility, which this humbles me, this whole idea that I, I'm nothing, I deserve to be crushed, I don't deserve God's love and, and mercy, but he extends it to me in spite of my undeserving nature. Uh, that just fills me with the fuel of gratitude yes. rather than the fuel of striving to keep my balloon filled with pride. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Right. So this is the nature, this is why the Christian world- and Prideful view. people are the most insecure people, right? Because oh, absolutely. Because you can pop the balloon by yes. taking away the very thing that, and it deflates all of it, and then they get angry. Well, it's because we're prideful that we are idol creators. We right. will take everything and create it into an idol because we are so prideful to begin with. And if we don't nip it in the bud, we end up being one of the guys in your book. Another cautionary tale. Another yeah. cautionary tale. Oh man, this is, this is all so good. I, I, I don't like the idea that I could understand myself better by reading uh, a book about murder cases, Yeah, but I think I have to read this. Well, but nothing else, it made me realize that I'm that guy. The guy I'm taking to jail is no different than me. I'm no better mm. than he is. He's no better than me. We're the same person. He, his buttons were pushed, mine weren't. So he did something that I could easily do. And I think that was the thing that changed my outlook on human, just humans I was coming in contact with. If you think you're better than the person you're interviewing, yeah. Then you've got a pride issue. That's right. Once you realize you're no different than the person you're interviewing, now you can start to at least approach humility. Yeah. And, and through the gospel and through regeneration, um, you, you spoke about like his buttons got pushed and yours, yes. yours didn't. But now you can push certain buttons on a Christian and things don't explode because the gospel has deactivated Yes. The, the circuitry. And there, because there's a common standard between us, I trust you as my brother in Christ to tell me when I'm sideways. Mm. That's the other thing too, is that if we don't have a common measuring stick, if there is not a God that is whose standard of righteousness is the thing we're comparing to, is the thing we're calling each other to, yeah. then it's really hard for me to say, yeah, why are you doing that? Uh, but as a yeah. Christian, a brother in Christ, you can, you can actually, I've, I'm giving you permission to tell me when I'm off track. Yeah. And, and, I, and, not, and you're not calling me to your standard. Yeah. And I'm not calling you to mine. We, we as, 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 this is the thing. A lot of us unite around common interests. You and I are not united around a common interest. You and I are united around a common father. It's very different. That is different. We have a certain level of commitment if we have common interests, common culture, common civilization, common country. But when we have a common father, that changes everything. 